Hi, this is Jennifer Klenick Yingling. Today I'd like to talk to you about hypertension, specifically some of the new guidelines that have come up and got people really riled up. Um, I think after this mini lecture, you may feel a little more comfortable, and that's my goal for um, this session. Cardiovascular disease risk factors. This is important for you to review with your patient. Do they have a um, documented or reported history of cardiovascular disease? Do they have a current or past um, history of cocaine use? Do they smoke or were they a smoker? Are they, if it's a female, are they taking birth control pills? Are they um, postmenopausal? Do they um, have a history of hypertension and are they taking their meds? That's huge. Are they obese? Remember the number 30 greater than or equal to 30 equals obese for the BMIs? Do they um, have a lifestyle that's inactive? Do they have a job that they're behind a desk where they don't get a lot of activity during the day? Do they have a history of dyslipidemia, diabetes? We know those are a couple of the big guns. Do they have microalbuminuria? That could tell us that there may be something going on with their kidney or a GFR less than 60. Age in um, for the patient as well as family members who have had a history of premature cardiovascular disease. For men, it's 55. For women, it's 65. And the same thing um, for the relative that's had that premature history. This is a atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk estimator. And this is endorsed by the American College of Cardiologists as well as the American Heart Association. And the reason we're going to talk about this is part of the new guidelines are that they, they want you to document the patient's risk. So this is a really quick and easy way for you to do it. It's a tried and true tool. Um, you can put it on your phone, you can put it on your laptop, it may even be in your EMR already. But I think it's important that you know what they're actually looking at. So the next slide talks about the risk factors that the tool uses. This tool is best used for ages 20 to 74. Under the age of 20, um, if they have two risk factors, that's a red flag that you have the um, your guard hairs up, this is a patient you need to be vigilant and treat aggressively for any uh, modifiable um, risk factors. So diabetes, um, high cholesterol, you want to really talk to them about smoking cessation sooner rather than later. So this tool again, it looks at um, sex, age, race, total cholesterol, um, specifically the HDL, which is your happy cholesterol and the good cholesterol, um, systolic blood pressure, is the patient diabetic? Do they smoke? And is there any um, current diagnosis or treatment for hypertension? There's three types of hypertension. There's primary, used to be called essential. This has to do with genetics. It can be um, secondary to aging, diet, obesity, and a sedentary um, lifestyle. Secondary hypertension, this is often caused by renal artery stenosis, chronic kidney disease, sleep apnea, that's a big one. With the DOTs, they're screening for um, sleep apnea, hot and heavy, along with the hypertension. Um, blood pressure, uh, birth control pills, alcohol use, pregnancy, um, thyroid disorders, coarctation of the aorta is another cause of secondary hypertension, as well as tumors of the adrenal gland, the, your field chromocytomas. Then there's the third kind, which is isolated systolic hypertension. You see this mostly in older adults. Um, they have stiffening of the arteries. They may, uh, we know that ISH um, definitely puts these patients at risk for a stroke or heart attack. So it's important that we do pay attention to that. So the new AHA blood pressure calcifications changed since last time. One of the biggest changes is uh, there's ba basically two. Um, there's no longer prehypertension. They're just calling it out. They're calling it what it is. It's elevated blood pressure. The other thing that changed are the numbers. And we changed from 140 over 90 
which was the start of our um, hypertension, and they dropped it down. They kind of reeled us all in and said, no, um, hypertension starts at 130, greater than 130, and um, greater than 80 uh, diastolically. So normal blood pressure now, the normal uh, readings are less than 120, with a um, systolic ileum with a diastolic less than 80. You, with these patients, you get uh, blood pressure that's under that. You want to evaluate that yearly. So for elevated blood pressure, this is a patient who has a um, systolic blood pressure of 120 to 129 millimeters of mercury with a diastolic systolic reading less than 80. Okay, these patients, if you're calling it elevated, you want to encourage lifestyle modifications, and you want to reassess every three to six months. Stage 1 hypertension is now 130 to 139, or systolically, or 80 to 89 millimeters of mercury diastolically. Okay, and this is where the assessment of the um, cardiac disease comes in. So you're going to do use their calculator. If the patient has less than 10% risk for healthy, um, you're going to offer lifestyle modifications. Okay. If it's greater than 10% or the patient has known comorbidities, the known cardiovascular disease, known diabetes, known chronic kidney disease, you're going to offer this patient lifestyle modifications and one antihypertensive med. And you're going to reassess in one month. So if you look at hypertension, stage one, one drug, one month. Okay. Hypertension stage two is a systolic uh, blood pressure equal to or greater than 140 um, millimeters of mercury and or um, a diastolic reading greater than or equal to 90 millimeters of mercury. For these patients, you're going to recommend lifestyle modifications and two blood pressure lowering medications of different classes, and you're going to reassess this patient in one month. So stage two, two meds. At the same time, you're going to start two. If the goal is you're going to bring these patients back in in a month. If their goal is met, then you can go back to reassessing every three to six months. If the goal is not met in one month, you may want to consider titrating up the medication and perhaps a, a different medication. You are going to monitor your blood pressure patients every month until you get um, control. Now, that being said, um, in the general population, you've got somebody who's totally healthy and happy, no comorbidities, you can bump up those um, guidelines to 140 over 90, okay? And it, for the exams, the national boards, you're going to be using JNC8 still, okay? I really doubt what you, the questions you're going to get are going to be super picky and a, a point or two off the uh, figures we talked about today. You're going to see somebody who is Definitely hypertension, 150 over 98, okay? There's not going to be a question. The question is going to be, how do you treat those patients? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So hypertension follow-up. These Your patients should return and follow up for adjustments of meds until your BP goal is reached every month. Um, they may have... Um, more frequent visits with you if they have stage 2 hypertension with um, complications or comorbidities. It doesn't hurt to bring them back in more. And your serum creatinine and potassium need to be monitored one to two times per year when your um, blood pressure is stable. After this uh, blood pressure goal is um, met and stable, you can follow up at that point every three to six months. So this is your beloved JNC8 hypertension guideline algorithm. We've used it for a while now. It's um, not awful to maneuver through, 
But I think um, once you see what they've done with the algorithm and the changes, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. So one thing you can look at with the JNC8 um, algorithm is that you can see that um, there were a lot of different choices. If you were over 60, you had one blood pressure. If you were under 60, there was another. Um, if it was diabetic, um, it was at 140 over 90, as well as chronic kidney disease. What the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiologists have done is they've kind of, you know, even the playing field. Everybody is 130 over 90. So in this slide, if you take out those numbers, you can take another look at the algorithm. So if your patient is, um, you know, have to look at the different blood pressures, you're going to group them together. This is patients younger than and older than 60. So it's all ages. Okay. If you move over to the right, you're going to see all ages with diabetes present. And that's not different either. So you can actually group this whole um, population per se. They're all 130 over 80. And the same thing is with all ages and races with chronic kidney disease. So everybody is at the same goal. And that's the biggest thing when we treat hypertension is setting the goal. The difference is, okay, the difference is that um, the different comorbidities, the different populations we treat. So there's three, non-black, black, and chronic kidney disease, okay? For the general population, 140 over 90, all right? For everybody with these new guidelines, it's 130 over 80, okay? Especially if they have some comorbidities. You want to be a little bit um, aggressive the way you're treating the patient. Um, you know, patient has documented cardiovascular disease. They've had a stroke. They have diabetes. They have that chronic kidney disease. They've had an MI. Okay? They have a triple A. They have um, peripheral artery disease. We know with uh, peripheral artery disease that um, this is an indicator for a cardiac um, uh, disease. You know, with the, the, um, the PAD, one of the things we can do is the ABI, measure that in the office, and you can bill for that too. Okay. In all of the cases, you saw lifestyle modifications, and I, I want you to be able to really give your patients good anticipatory guidance and understand what all of those lifestyle modifications mean and, and what potentially they could do. So if you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, you really need to talk to your patients about weight loss. Um, weight loss, you want to encourage at least one kilogram of weight loss each month. Hopefully they will, you know, have more, um, take more off between visits. But by doing that, you potentially can get one point per kilogram and really drop your um, blood pressure. So say you lost 20 pounds, okay? 20 pounds, well, to say, well, let's make it easy. We'll have it be 22 pounds, okay? Your patient loses 22 pounds. Potentially, they could drop 10 points on their blood pressure, okay? So that's a huge bang for their buck. DASH diet. You want to talk to the patients about this because we know approximately 3 to 11 um, points they can drop their pressure. DASH diet, that emphasizes vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. It includes fat-free, low-dairy, fish, poultry, beans, nuts, and uh, vegetable oils. Um, with this diet, you do limit foods with high saturated fat, and you limit uh, sugar-sweetened beverages and foods. There's been a big push. I know some of the advertisement that's out there really pushing for individuals to pay attention to what they're drinking, the calories, um, and uh, sweetened beverages, and they're, you know, uh, encouraging 
the increase of uh, consumption of water. Sodium reduction is huge too. Okay, the goal of the sodium intake should be less than 1500 milligrams per day and you can drop your pressure with um, decreasing the sodium in your diet about two to six points. Potassium supplement. This is something that's important if your patient has low potassium you want to treat it. Um, you want to make sure that your patient's getting 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams per day. Um, they usually can do it with diet and it's usually four to five servings of fruit or vegetables daily. Um, supplementing the potassium that affects the uh, blood pressure um, by two to five points. Physical activity. We know that um, the big number right now is 150 minutes per week. So that's 30 minutes five times a day, even if it's walking. Encourage your patients to get out there or get physically active. With that, they can drop two to eight points. You also want to encourage uh, decreased alcohol consumption. Um, a little bit of a gender disparity per se. Women can only have one drink versus men who can have two drinks per day. And this too can drop the pressure um, three to four points. Tobacco cessation. Um, you want to make sure you ask about this at every visit. Um, your patient may need some help with behavioral interventions. They may need um, or request to go on some of the drugs that help patients quit, your Chantix, um, and that can drop an additional three points. So if they work hard you're, with their weight, with their diet, with some of the supplements and activity and tobacco, potentially they can drop their um, blood pressure by 20 points. What are some of the things that we want to monitor with our patients with hypertension? You may order an echo. You'll be looking at the um, ejection fraction and at the valves. You're going to be looking for um, pulmonary hypertension. With your EKG, you're going to be looking for signs of the pulmonary hypertension again, a sign of uh, LVH. Have they had a previous MI, some heart damage, um, some blood work you might consider. A TSH, we know with hypertension, sometimes it can be the secondary um, hypertension, and a TSH is helpful. You're going to do a CBC, are they anemic? Um, a CMP, you're going to look at their renal function, their BUN, creatinine, GFR, potassium, sodium, and their glucose. If they are known diabetic or pre-diabetic, you may be monitoring their A1C, too, to see where they're, they're at with everything. So we're going to go back to the algorithm and if we cross everything off and we even the playing field, basically there are six drugs that you need to know for the current guidelines. Okay, you've got your thiazide, ACE, ARB, calcium channel blocker, All right. then you've got your beta blockers and aldosterone antagonists. Okay, six drugs. You've memorized way more than six drugs in your careers, um, so you'll have no problem getting a good handle on this stuff. Okay, the first drug I'm going to talk about is thiazide. Okay, this is a great add-on. Okay, kind of like a booster. Um, keep in mind that thiazide decreases sodium. It increases the potassium. This is a good drug for somebody who's had a secondary stroke diabetes, um, heart failure. This is a great drug if the patient doesn't have insurance because it's on a lot of the $4 lists that are at some of the um, stores now, the pharmacies. Um, when do you want to avoid thiazide? Metabolic syndrome. Why? It increases triglycerides. It can in increase their glucose. It can increase the lipoprotein. Okay. You also want to avoid thiazide with gout. Um, this can put them into a hyperuricemia. Uh, you want to use caution with a sulfa allergy. Um, some patients who are allergic to sulfa also will have an allergy to thiazide. And you also want to avoid with NSAIDs because giving um, the thiazide on top of the NSAID um, or vice versa, this um, can cause prerenal failure by decreasing the blood flow to those kidneys. What are, what is the suffix that's uh, associated with thiazide? It's the ide, okay? 
So hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, common. It used to be the first line drug, and it's not necessarily um, the first line anymore. We've got some other choices. So one of those other choices is calcium channel blockers, okay? This is the first line drug for hypertension for our black patients, for our elderly patients. It um, interacts with grapefruit juice, maybe cranberries. We know that calcium channel blockers work better at night. Um, maybe one way you can remember that is Covera HS. That's a calcium channel blocker. So if you want to help the drug work, you can actually have your patient take their calcium channel blocker in the nighttime. Who benefits from a calcium channel blocker? Somebody with isolated systolic hypertension. Those patients are usually elderly. Patients with Renaud's, okay, because it increases, um, this, it dilates the smooth muscle. They get better blood flow. Patients with diabetes and patients who are over 55. When do you want to avoid a calcium channel blocker? This is one of those pearls, one of those greatest hits per se. You want to avoid in uh, patients that have GERD. And it may be a patient that ends up with GERD uh, syndrome because like I said, they calcium channel blockers relax the smooth muscle and that can relax that muscular sphincter, the, the lower esophageal sphincter. And when that happens, they will get more symptoms of the GERD. So with these patients, they may have new symptoms of GERD or they may have an exacerbation, um, somebody who was in control. So there's two different kinds of calcium channel blockers too. There's their DHP and the non-DHP. And for the DHP um, calcium channel blockers, they, they have the last name, uh, last, the suffix peen, okay? Your aminolodipine, <clears throat> your nifedipine, and then you've got your non d DHP um, calcium channel blockers. And these decrease the heart rate, diltiazem, verapamil. Okay, so if you want to try to remember which one's safe and which one isn't um, safe, if you're worried about bradycardia, um, you can remember in the, the DHP, it doesn't hurt the pulse. Okay. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. These are your ACEs. These are pretty popular drugs too. These drugs you can end up, uh, the patient can complain to you about a dry cough that's pretty common. It's an ACE cough. Um, the ACE cough can be so problematic for the patients that they will um, end up asking to come off the drug because they're so uncomfortable. Okay, it's an itchy, dry, tickly type of cough. Um, keep in mind that the ACE inhibitors, this decreases your potassium excretion. So if your patient's on potassium supplements or on a potassium sparing diuretic, um, you don't want them to get into trouble with some hyperkalemia. These patients may complain of fatigue. They may um, talk to you um, once starting the drug about a loss of taste. Who benefits from the ACE? Um, patients with the history of a secondary stroke, um, diabetes, it's thought to, um, ACEs are thought to be renal protective and slow diabetic nephro, nephropathy, okay, um, heart failure patients, uh, chronic kidney disease, and patients under 55. When do you want to avoid these? Um, you know, you don't want to give and ASIN and ARB together because both of them cause that localized um, swelling. They can have angioedema. So if you have two um, drugs doing the same thing, working on the same route, um, you can uh, your patient can get into some trouble. So you never want to give ACE and ARB together. Um, I don't say never. I guess you never say never in our business, but you would try to avoid using them. Okay. NSAIDs decrease the effectiveness. Okay, because that runs on that same uh, renal track. Okay, um, you don't want to use it in pregnancy. It's thought to cause birth defects. And you, like I said, there's that triad. They say it's kind of like um, nephrotoxic toxic, uh, triad. And says ACE and diuretic. You don't, don't, 
don't want to give them all together unless you want to box your patient's kidneys. And like we talked about, you don't want to give the, um, take these with ARBs. The suffix for this drug is Pril, Catapril, Enapril, Rampril, Lisinopril. Okay, those are some examples. So then you've got your angiotensin II receptor blockers. Okay, these are your ARBs. Okay, we talked about the ACE and the ARBs together. You don't want to give them together because of that angioedema, localized um, swelling. We know that the NSAIDs decrease the effectiveness. You want to avoid the ACE. Um, and the ARBs are actually a pregnancy black box. Okay, do not want to give in pregnancy. And if your patient's on lithium, it's um, important to note that um, the ARBs can increase toxicity. Who benefits if patients with diabetes, um, heart failure, renal failure? Um, this is good for black and non-black patients. If you have your choice between a calcium channel blocker and an ARB um, with your black patients, you probably want to use the calcium channel blocker and a thiazide. Um, keep in mind that this um, the ARB does decrease the um, sodium and it um, decreases the potassium excretion so you can have trouble with the um, hyperkalemia with these patients. So you want to be sure you're checking a BUN, creatinine, your potassium, and your sodium. The suffix for this drug is sartan, losartan, ibersartan, um, for as a couple examples. So moral of the story, no ACE and ARB together. Um, for your black patients, um, you want to use your um, calcium channel blocker with the thiazide. Beta blocker. Um, you never want to use a beta blocker for as a first line for hypertension. Um, when you get finished here or you get a chance, I want you to look at the guideline and you'll see that it's way down on your step approach. Okay, these patients, um, when you put them on the beta blocker, may feel like they're in the fog. They may complain of fatigue, tell you they have cold hands and feet. They may talk about some weight gain. They really um, don't always feel super great on this. Who benefits from your beta blockers? Your post MI, okay? Anyone who's had a, a myocardial infarction should be on a beta blocker. We know it decreases the afterload. We know that it's an injured muscle. Um, it needs to rest. We also know that after an MI, um, having that beta blocker decreases the mortality, okay? Um, heart failure patients do well on this. Pregnancy, labetalol is one of the drugs that is safe in pregnancy. Patients also are put on uh, beta blockers for stage fright and essential tremors. When do you want to avoid beta blockers? Um, for patients who have asthma or COPD, especially those patients who are poorly controlled, patients who have Renaud's, okay, um, peripheral um, artery disease, Okay, you get a little bit of constriction in the extremities, so they, they can um, have an exacerbation of their symptoms. Patients who already have bradycardia, so if your patient already has a, a pulse in the 40s, this probably isn't the best drug to give them, okay, because it can worsen that uh, bradycardia. Beta blockers also can worsen lipids, and you also would like to, you should avoid uh, beta blockers in your patient's who are diabetic because the beta blockers um, mask signs and symptoms of the hypoglycemia, the tachycardia, the sweating. Um, keep in mind too with beta blockers you don't want to stop them abruptly because it has been shown that patients can end up having a myocardial infarction. Um, and we talked a little bit um, about HDL earlier. But people with um, low HDLs or borderline, you worry about um, them on a beta blocker because beta blockers decrease the HDL. And remember, HDL, that's the happy um, cholesterol. That's the good cholesterol. So you don't want that to be low. You want that to be as high as it can be. The suffix for the beta blockers is LOL, labetalol, atenolol, metropolol, propranolol. 
Aldosterone antagonists. Um, this is a, a drug. It's an old-fashioned drug, too. Spironolactolone, aldactolone. Um, one of the things that you can see with this drug, the patients can get gynomastia, which is um, they shouldn't be lactating, but they have um, milk come from their breasts. This is extremely upsetting, especially for men. Um, you know, it is reversible, but it is something you may um, run into in your practice. Who benefits from the aldosterone antagonist? This is a patient that has resistant hypertension. This is a patient who's having, um, who has primary aldosteronism that isn't diagnosed. We know that about 20% of um, patients with resistant um, hypertension have primary aldosteronism. Um, this may be a patient that has an adrenal adenoma, uh, and your obese patients with visceral fat. It's thought that L aldosterone antagonists counteract um, diets high in sodium, and they also use this for um, females with acne off-label. When do you want to avoid your aldosterone antagonists? Anyone that has any renal impairment, um, you can end up with some hyperkalemia. You want to be sure you're monitoring your um, potassium. Another um, condition that it wouldn't be great to use the aldosterone is your Addison's. Um, you don't want to use this with any nephrotoxic drugs. And you definitely want to monitor your monitor diuresis, especially if this is given in conjunction with an A, ACE or an ARB and NSAIDs because um, decrease the efficacy and also you worry about the nephrotoxicity. Um, back to the why you want to monitor the diuresis with the ACE or an ARB, um, they can end up diuresing too fast. They can end up with postural uh, hypotension. Um, fall hit their head and then you've got a whole nother story. So the last, uh, the suffix for aldosterone antagonist is own, spirolactolone, aldactolone. So there are some populations that, um, you know, you may see and some pearls just to keep in mind. And one of the things um, for isolated systolic hypertension, the ISH, so, uh, calcium channel blockers is your best choice. Patients with diabetes, um, your ACE is good, but when you give an ACE, you want to make sure you monitor the potassium. We like the ACE because it's uh, renal protective. African Americans, um, calcium channel blocker and thiazide, we find that uh, beta blockers and ARBs don't work as well in this population. Post MI, you want to get this patient a beta blocker. It decreases the afterload and it increases these. Uh, patient's uh, mortality. Gastroesophageal reflux, you want to avoid calcium channel blockers. We talked that it, it um, decreases the smooth muscle tone and can um, relax the LES, thus giving you um, reflux symptoms. Patients with uh, BPH, benign prostatic uh, hypertrophy, you may want to use an alpha blocker, kind of a two for one. You can take care of the blood pressure as well as um, take care of some of the um, prostate symptoms. This is your terosin uh, or hytrin, it's a, another name. Metabolic syndrome, we know we want to avoid thiazide. This increases the glucose, increases the triglycerides, also can increase the hyperuricemia. Okay, so metabolic syndrome, no thiazides. Pregnancy, um, there's a couple drugs you can use, methyl dopa, which is an oldie but goodie, as well as uh, beta blockers. In pregnancy, you definitely, definitely, definitely want to avoid your ACE and your ARBs, okay? They are not compatible with pregnancy. If you have a patient who is in the childbearing years and they're on either these drugs, you may want to change them to something else um, because they're going to be changed once they become pregnant, okay? CHF, um, you want to avoid calcium channel blockers. We talked about how it decreases that smooth muscle, and, and when it does that, um, it kind of vasodilates, so all that fluid um, kind of goes wild, and they can have increased edema on top of the edema they already have. COPD and asthma, you want to avoid your beta blockers because this, especially if they're poorly controlled, can interact with their... Um, Saba and Lamas. 
Saba and Lavas, okay? Your beta agonists, inhalers, your long acting, your short acting. Um, kidney stones, you want to avoid the diuretics. Uh, diuretics. Um, if you get them a little bit too dry, they can end up becoming symptomatic with their kidney stones. Gout, um, you want to avoid the diuretics because it can, um, you can see, increase hyperuricemia and they can end up having a uh, flare of the gout. They won't be super happy with you. Renouts, you want to give calcium channel blockers because that's going to relax the smooth muscle, vasodilate. Um, we know with Renouts they can have vasoconstriction, so you want to avoid the beta blockers. And with sulfa allergies, so, uh, just a quick pearl, you want to avoid furosemide and thiazide because these patients can have a cross-reactivity um, allergic reaction with these drugs. So I hope this helped you out. Just a couple pearls about hypertension. Talk about the new guidelines. Um, you can find us at aprncentral.com. If you have any questions, please email me at jen, J-E-N, at aprncentral.com. You can also find us on Facebook, APRN Central Study Group. And I wish you the best of luck in your studying, your prepping, as well as your future practice or current practice. Take care.